Okay, so I'm talking to John Champaglia today for, for, for the very first time. Something, by the way, that should have happened a very long while ago. But uh, we're here at last, uh, and we're going to have a conversation that's going to be general and impersonal in nature, as always. There's also a disclaimer on your screen right now. So if you don't like losing money, go ahead, pause your screen, read that disclaimer. It's important for you, for your own, for your own safety. And uh, with all that said, John, thank you for investing in time with me, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, better late than never. Oh, absolutely. That's well said. Yeah. And the pleasure is all mine, of course, especially because this is, um, I think it's going to be an interesting conversation because I'm trying to better understand physical funds in general. And if you're talking about physical precious metals funds or physical uranium funds or whatever, you go to Sprott, obviously. And so I think that's going to be a, an interesting conversation. Um, and I guess... I've been seeing questions and comments just to sort of pick this up from somewhere. I've been seeing questions and comments, in some of my videos that have been telling me that maybe there's others out there who also don't completely understand what a physical fund is besides me. So it's kind of making me feel good about myself, but then uh, it still doesn't help me understand it. So why don't we take it way back at the very basics of what a physical metals fund is? Can, can you tell me that, John? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to start there. So, you know, Sprott has been managing these physical commodity funds for about 12 years now. So um, we have a lot of experience running them and, you know, I'll, I'll acknowledge they're not the easiest thing to, to, to figure out because there's a lot of moving parts underneath the hood and they're governed by very lengthy uh, regulatory documents, which I always dread reading. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, um, these funds exist because they're a way they allow investors that want to express a view in a specific commodity. They allow them to, to gain exposure to that commodity without having to go and secure the commodity themselves. So, you know, when you think about buying physical gold or silver, I mean, you can go down and, and to your local dealer and buy a coin or a small bar. And the responsibility is basically on you to, to store it and, and insure it. With, with physical uranium, it's obviously one of the uh, most highly regulated uh, substances in the world. Uh, you only can store it at licensed facilities at a few places in the West, and those are in the U.S., Canada, and France. So it's uh, very interesting, you know, in terms of being able to create the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust to us when we started this, this project to be able to give people a, a, an easy way to gain exposure to a very difficult to access commodity. And with the trust structure, it also provides a lot of transparency to, again, a, an opaque market when you're talking about uranium. So it's a very interesting vehicle. And I think of a lot of investors around the world have responded to it um, as we re-engineered the, the fund to be more transparent and liquid and um, you know, publish every night what we're doing with the fund in terms of its holdings and its net asset value. It provides a, a great level of transparency to investors and they've responded accordingly. I think that's, that's, that's uh, maybe an understatement, but pe pe the Sprott Physical Uranium is probably the most loved vehicle in the uranium um, market right now, I, I, I guess. Um, Okay, just to sort of make sure, how does that work? So if, if I were to buy shares of Sput, where, so what, what do you do with that money? You're, you're buying uranium that's basically to my own name, and then you're storing it for me, or how, how does that work? Sure, yeah. So basically, if you were to go to the market and then try to buy shares, you could be buying secondary shares from an existing investor, or you know, unbeknownst to you, you could be actually buying shares from one of our two underwriters that we've basically empowered to issue new units when they're trading at a premium to the previous day NAV. So some days we're, we're not issuing any units at all, which was, you know, we went, we just went through a dry spell, of, you know, seven or eight weeks ago. Um, and then when the fund is trading at a premium, which signals investors are interested in the category and they think the price is going up, then it gives us the ability to issue new units. So at the end of the trading day, we get a report that basically says, hey, we issued these units. The, the underwriter is short those units because they sold them into the marketplace. And then we issue the new units from the trust. We get the cash and then we go and buy more uranium. So it's a very simple process. It's, it's, a, it's a very active process in terms of the way we do the capital raising. It's called an at the market offering. And it's a very... Uh, shareholder friendly way to raise new capital. 
And I say that for two reasons. One, it has very low friction costs. And two, it's very responsive in real time. So if an institution is interested in, in, in getting involved in the trust, there, there can be the opportunity to, you know, to create large blocks of shares of liquidity for that investor instead of them coming into the market and trying to source them on a secondary basis, which you know, could move the price around on them. So they get basically security uh, of, their, of their trade. Um, and that's how a lot of institutions have opted to, to get involved with the trust. Um, you know, you, you, we have everything from individual investors right up to very large institutions. Um, and the ATM has been a very efficient vehicle to raise capital. So, you know, last year from August to December 31st, we raised about a billion in US dollars. From Jan 1 to today, I think we're at 850. Uh, and, you know, just to put all that in context, we started the fund last July and was only at 630 million US AUM. So the fund has grown exponentially and, and way beyond our expectations, obviously. So it's, um, it's, it's obviously become the, the fund of choice for a lot of institutions and individual investors in terms of if they want to get exposure to the spot commodity market. Right, 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 right. And so it's worth mentioning maybe that you're, you're only listed in, um, in Canada. So that's, I mean, that, that also proves something to me that uh, even only being listed there, you've been able to grow it that much. So that was an interesting development too. Um, yeah, I would say I would say that the fund is probably eighty percent institutional at this point in terms of its investor mix, and, and and institutional investors obviously have no problem accessing you know just about any ticker in the world. Um, so they you know they had no problem picking you know whether they want to trade in, in Canadian dollars or U.S. dollars, um, and then for U.S. retail uh, we do have a OTC best market ticker as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, fair enough. Who, who, just this might sound like a stupid question, but who owns the uranium when does the Sprout own the uranium that you're storing or is it your investors that own it? Yeah. So the trust is the beneficial owner of the uranium. It's not Sprout. Sprout is the manager of the trust and the, all the assets of the trust basically belong to the underlying shareholders. So think of us as just the, the manager of the trust and the trust has a declaration that basically governs its operation that we're, we have to follow, but the assets belong to all the unit holders. So the, one of the things that people need to, be, to understand is that when you, when you operate one of these trusts, there's like a hundred plus page document that governs how, how it operates. So if investors really wanna get into the nitty gritty of, of, of uh, its you know, operation, that rule book is set in stone. The only way I can change that rule book, uh, if there's any kind of material change to it, is to actually go to all the shareholders and ask for their permission. And that's obviously a pretty b- big hurdle. So if I wanted to make a material change to that declaration of trust document, we would have to call a special meeting and investors would have to look at the proposal and vote on it. So that's the way these vehicles. So that governance of the trust is, is very strong, which is why we, we like these structures. They're also very transparent. And that's why investors like them. Okay. It's starting to make way more sense right now. Um, how how is how is that different? Maybe you know, maybe you don't. You don't have to, but just to to see how how is that different from other physical uranium vehicles like um, Yellow Cake, for example. That they don't. I, I believe they don't have an ATM, but they do have the ability to liquidate their holdings at the will of the fund managers. So, it, how how is your fund different? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. You know, sure of the the specifics of, of some of the other vehicles that are in the market, but they're they're typically structured as companies, not investment funds. Um, mm-hmm. So the the corporate the the, the structure themselves are different. Uh, there's very different. There's big differences between corporate funds and investment funds. The the predecessor vehicle that we acquired, Uranium Participation Corp, was a company structure that had a board of directors and and, and like a typical company. Uh, the trust is really governed by a different set of, of rules that regulators set out, as well as the underlying uh, declaration of trust, which governs the trust itself. Um, I think the only scenario we would ever wind up the fund, and, and um, if memory serves me, is that if the fund got to a very small amount, let's say $50 million of assets, we would deem it to not be viable. Um, and how you'd ever get to that size, I physically don't know how that could happen, given the fund is $3 billion right now. Um, so 
the, the reality is, is these trusts, we, we view them as perpetual trusts, which means they go on forever. Unless there's an event that, that makes the fund not viable, um, there's no real reason to do anything different. We've off, we often get asked this question, well, what's, this end, what's the end game or goal for the trust? And the answer is really simple. Keep growing, keep growing, keep stacking, keep, keep increasing liquidity and allowing more and more investors to participate in the sector if they wish to. So it's a very simple structure. The financial incentive we have is, to, is exactly that, is to keep growing the trust. We make a management fee as the assets grow uh, we make more fees. So, you know, there's no incentive in terms of winding up a fund. It's the same thing. Let's say you were running a technology fund. Let's say you were running a, you know, a tech mutual fund or whatever, or a, a, a usage fund. If, if, the, if the sector went up 100%, the manager of the technology fund isn't going to say, oh, we just had a 100% gain. Here's all your money back. But it's not how these investment funds work. It, it's not a market trading. It's not a market timing vehicle. It's a, it's a passive vehicle. That, that is designed to operate in perpetuity to allow investors to participate in a very difficult to, to invest sector. It's very simple. Yeah, it, it, I think it is. And, and that's the, um, I think it's becoming more simple for me now, but it, that's, is that the goal for like the you know, other funds, like PSLV, for example, as well? Is that the same goal? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, PSLV, uh, PHYS, our, our gold and silver trust, have been operating for the last 12 years. Um, other than other than selling metal to pay expenses when we didn't have sufficient cash, we've never sold a single ounce of metal in any of our funds. We've never lent out a single ounce or pound of metal to to any with any of our funds. So it's a very simple strategy, um, and uh, you know everything is very well disclosed in, in all the regulatory documents. Oh, okay, but so they're not. So you you haven't sold a single ounce of gold and silver. The, but could you? So th- it's just the same as as the spot. Like basically, you if you want to sell, you would still have to go to all the shareholders and ask them to do that. No, no, no. So just to, let me back up a second. So if I needed to pay the operating expenses of the funds, the management fee, you know, storage and insurance, all that kind of stuff, if I didn't have sufficient cash in the trust to pay for those operating expenses, I could sell little bits of metal, raise the cash and pay for the, for the operation of the fund. And that can happen from time to time, but generally it rarely happens because we always hold cash buffer so that we don't have to sell metal. So for example, in the uranium trust, <clears throat> since last July, we haven't sold a single pound of uranium because we've always had enough cash to pay the operating expenses. If I didn't have any cash, we ran out, ran out and we're not raising any new capital, then you know I might be forced to sell a little bit of uranium and, and just you know rebuild the cash position. But again, we've been running these funds for 12 years and we're pretty good at it. So we manage all of those things. Mm. I, I was mostly referring to um, maybe the redemption mechanism because that's not exactly clear to me as well that like um, the gold and silver funds do have it. And for obvious reasons, the spot doesn't have it. What is the difference there, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. So yeah, for our gold and silver funds, we do have a physical and a cash redemption mechanism built into those. And that's a New York Stock Exchange requirement, actually. Or sorry, excuse me, an SEC requirement because they trade on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, now, obviously, you know, if you have enough shares and you say to us, look, I, wanna, I want you to deliver me one 400 ounce London Good Delivery gold bar, or, you know, you send me 10,000 ounces of London Good Delivery silver, we will accommodate you every month. You have an option to put in a request and you can make arrangements with our, with our vault to, to have an armored car or whatever, pick it up for you and, and deliver it to wherever you want. Um, we rarely have people do that, but people have done it from time to time. Um, physical uranium obviously is a very different category in terms of, as I mentioned, it's the most regulated substance on earth. So you're not allowed to take physical, you can take physical title to it, but you're not allowed to take physical delivery, uh, obviously. And the reality is, is like most people wouldn't be able to open up a storage agreement at at one of these conversion uh, facilities. So there, there's a real practical limitation in terms of giving physical uh, uranium to people. Um, the other question we often get asked is, will you sell uranium if the trust is trading at a discount? And I think the last couple of months is a really good illustration. So. You know, I was in I was out in California about four weeks ago and we had that broad sell-off across all asset classes. 
you know, and the fund widened out over about a five day period to a 16% discount. And I was meeting with an institution in California and they said, well, why don't you guys start buying back your shares? And, and I said, well, we don't do that. We don't really think it works. Um, especially if you need to sell the underlying material in a distressed in market environment, you end up just putting more and more pressure on the market, you know? And so over those five days, trust me, I was not happy with the way the trust was trading, but I said to him, like, you just have to, you just have to be patient. We're in a market dislocation across everything. The market will kind of find a, a you know, a stabilizing point here and we will see value buyers come in, take advantage of dislocation. And sure enough, a couple of days later, I was, I was continuing my meetings in California and I, and I met a hedge fund based in Brazil that said to me, you know, we've been in the sector since 2019, we're very bullish. And I was buying like crazy when the discount opened up. And that's exactly what I wanted to hear because five, day, five days later, the discount was essentially uh, mostly gone. Um, so the market, you know, basically arbitrages itself. Um, investors have to think about, you know, are they day trading or are they, do they have a longer term view and do they have conviction around their investment? So, you know, the fund will trade at premiums and discounts that creates opportunities for people to kind of come in and out. And, and that's exactly how free markets work. So um, the fund is back to, you know, back to its net asset value. It's been at small premiums over the last week or so. And the, and the trust has been back to capital raising. Yep. That's something that I've said. That's actually another topic that I'm, I'm hoping we're going to target is to just to how much money you're sitting on and why is it that much? The uh, just to sort of go back to the redemption mechanism, though, it, it sounds like it adds it adds a certain optionality to your gold and silver funds, but then it takes it away on the uranium fund. So would that mean, and this is a sincere question, I'm not trying to pick at you or whatever, but would it mean that the gold and silver stock uh, funds are less, they carry less risk than the uranium fund? Does that, does that make any sense? Yeah, I think I know what you're asking. I mean, essentially with the arbitrage mechanism, um, they, they will put a floor under that discount. Hmm. So for example, in our gold and silver funds, if you look historically at how they've traded relative to NAV, and all of this is disclosed on our website, it's brought.com, you will see they, t- they do trade in a tighter kind of collar around NAV. And that's because that, that redemption mechanism does help to arb the funds. So without... Without the redemption mechanism, you require you basically rely on other market participants to arb the fund for you. So, for example, that Brazilian hedge fund, he was acting as an arb basically, as somebody was trying to sell into a soft market. He was basically buying the shares on the cheap, and he obviously he's done quite well in, in the last three four weeks. So, markets are constantly arbing. There's different ways to arb it, but we hope that over time. The fund will trade close to its net asset value. Obviously, we can't guarantee it because it's a closed end fund. But if you look at the history of SPOT since it started, it's 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 traded very close to NAV, which which is I think a pretty amazing thing for a closed end fund. So, look at, at times there are periods where you know in periods of extreme bullishness, people will pay more for the fund than SPOT the SPOT commodity price because they think the commodity price is going up and they're willing to to pay more in order to get shares. Uh, at other times, they're gonna be a for seller, like we saw a few weeks ago, where a number of funds said to me, look, we're really bullish, but when the CIO calls and says, bring down risk across the whole portfolio, I don't have a choice. Um, so that happens, you know, we saw we saw that dislocation. But I think the, the takeaway is if you saw, if you saw the way the fund traded, it was a real sharp V, you know, the discount came back, um, closed pretty quickly. So that is a great example of an arbitrage happening real time. It's a great case study. Yeah, I th- I think so. But it also shows that uh, there were, there were people joking around on Twitter and rightfully so. I guess is that um, someone was speculating that technically you can go to a hundred percent discount to NAV technically because you don't have that redemption mechanism. And then people on Twitter were were saying like it literally would never happen because if it goes to like ten cents, I would just buy the entirety of the fund and that's where it's going to stop so it's never going so but it, why, why i'm bringing this up is because if you're in a strong commodity market especially with uranium ura- uranium at 50 dollars doesn't make sense already <clears throat> excuse me but uranium under 50 dollars makes even less than no sense if that's a thing so could it really go much lower than that technically i guess by what you're explaining but what is the probability of that doesn't seem high yeah, to me. yeah look at the end of the day 
um, whether you're valuing a commodity or a stock, there's, there's different perceptions of value. Um, and it doesn't matter how cheap a stock gets, you, you see there's an arbitrage process with every, every asset, meaning there are always value buyers that will look and say, okay, this thing is, is you know, at a value that provides me a huge intrinsic you know, lift here. Um, if I'm a patient liquidity provider, and so like, it's just preposterous to think that it would trade at a discount like that. You mean, you're basically saying you're giving away something for free, which, you know, if something has real value, um, it'll never trade down to that kind of level. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously I'd take it. Uh, so it makes sense to me. But now that we're talking about sort of Twitter speculations, uh, allow me to tell you what else I've read, John, is that um, people are sort of speculating on Twitter that, when utilities or, or the government with recent news, when they eventually find themselves without any uranium, you might raise a shareholder vault to, to try and, and sell them the yellow cake at a premium. Is that too forward looking to talk about? Or is that something that you can say, you know, it's absolutely not happening? Or, or how should I look at this? Yeah, I think that the probability of that happening is almost zero. Um, mm-hmm. First of all, it would not be our decision, right? As I said to you earlier, it's a perpetual trust. We don't have any incentive to ever put a shareholder vote. If somebody wanted to to make a proposal, then as the manager, we're required to put that forward to shareholders. But you're talking about someone that would have the ability to buy 56 million and growing pounds of uranium. Um, So I think the probability of it is essentially zero. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. That's uh, th- those are the question that people are uh, the questions that people are, are asking. So that that sort of helps me better understand this as well. And um, could you help me understand what happens if there's no deals? Like if there is nothing out there for you to buy, what what happens with the money? What happens to the price of uranium too? Yeah. Well, I would say there there's always, as I said, there's always an incentive price that can be reached for somebody to finally call you and say. Um, you know, willing to sell you my pounds. And we, we've got a list of people that are on our, on our call list to, you know, constantly a to touch base with, to, to find out when they're ready to sell. So, but it's, but, but, you know, I think you're raising a good point is that it's, it is a tight market. It's, it's, and it's, it's a tight market because as I said earlier, most of the pounds are earmarked for, for long-term utility contracting. You know, the spot market was always a home for all the pounds that didn't have that didn't have a, a long term contract associated with them. And that was one of the reasons that the market was somewhat suppressed, because, you know, these producers uh, didn't sign long term contracts and then they would get dumped in the market. And, uh, you know, if there was no buyer, it could put pressure on the price, obviously. So what we've seen in the last few months is utilities have stepped down their their buying in the spot market it was always a, a very minor part of their procurement strategy and a lot of them have, have pivoted back to what they're more comfortable with and more traditional for them which is buying on long-term contracts and you know if you listen to Cameco's uh results in the last few months you, you'll get a pretty strong signal from them that they've been big beneficiaries of utilities coming to them to lock in lock in long-term contracts so Utilities, I think, are finally responding. Um, they've seen the price increase. They've seen the, the supply disruptions and the, the threats of sanctions and, and, and uh, reverse sanctions by Russia to, to act as catalysts to say, look, the market's changed. The, the days of me going to the market and buying uranium at 28 bucks as much as I wanted are long gone now. <laughs> well, actually, all the cash that you're holding, if if... The, if, if the people selling uranium to you know it and they do because it's public information, wouldn't that incentivize them to be like, no, I don't have that much uranium. I don't want to sell it to you unless you pay me 75 bucks. Is that, could, could that ever happen? Yeah. I mean, that doesn't happen. I mean, it's, it's the market is a lot more stable than you think. Um, the, the market is, is, you know, yes, it's, it's not as liquid and, and the, the pricing is not as tight as you see for other, other commodities, but it, it doesn't work like that. If people don't want to sell, they don't want to sell. Um, but as I said, people have all kinds of financial incentives, uh, whether they're traders that have to, to sell or whether they're investment funds that want to take a profit 
on their material because they bought it 28 bucks or, or whatever the case may be. So, um, you know, it's a free market. People, people have all kinds of reasons why they want to sell their material. And they do. I mean, if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't have been able to buy 37 million pounds. Mm, right, 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 right. And you're only going to keep looking for those pounds on the spot market. You don't intend on si signing long-term contracts. No, I mean, <clears throat> we try to buy as short a delivery window as possible. And the reason for that is simple. The shorter the window, the less counterparty risk I have to deal with. Mm. So if you start going out in term and, 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 and whatnot, then you're talking about entering into all kinds of different uh, scenarios that you know, may or may not happen. But if a material is available with short-term delivery, you'd always go for that first. See, that's why you're managing this fund and not me. Uh, John, I know you have to go. Uh, we are already over the time that you promised me. So uh, I'm going to let you go. Is there something, some last, whatever that you want to add here at the end? Yeah, listen, I would just say, um, do your education, do your research, do your due diligence. Uh, try, to, try to stay away from going down too many rabbit holes. Uh, and stick to the fundamentals because there's a lot of news flow that's very positive right now in the sector and make decisions based on that. Not, uh, not a lot of noise. Exactly. Very well said. John Champagne, thank you for investing your time in me, sir. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.